Welcome to the Winnetka History Express, a virtual trolley adventure brought to you by the Winnetka Historical Society. This tour will take you through time and space, from the Native American settlement at Indian Hill, through the village's historic business district, to the scenic Skokie Lagoons, and much more. You'll learn about many fascinating people, places, and events from the village's founding in 1869 to 2021. Now keep your hands inside the windows and stay seated for safety as we start the tour. Our first stop is at Indian Hill on the southern edge of Winnetka. Here is the Indian Hill train station. This stone carving honors the Native Americans who lived in Winnetka before settlers arrived in the 1800s. The relief was carved by North Shore artist James Cady Ewell in 1939 when they rebuilt the train station. Village authorities wanted to build a statue honoring the Potawatomi and other tribes native to the region. When they built the underpass, the village got their opportunity. Notice how the designs are high up. Ewell designed it that way to look like the tall and elegant figures of Rockefeller Center in New York. The first Europeans built their houses on Indian Hill for the same reason as the Native Americans. It was high up. Indian Hill is part of an ancient sand ridge that kept residents safe and dry during the wet season in the spring. The first European settlers built their log houses, like the Doyle home pictured here, close to the Green Bay Trail on present-day Church Road. The mailman for this route was Alexis Claremont, a French-Canadian born on Mackinac Island who traveled from Fort Dearborn in Chicago to Green Bay, Wisconsin. He trekked the 240-mile trip with up to 60 pounds of mail on his back from 1832 to 1836. Along his route, Claremont would have passed the Schmidt family house. The Schmidt family immigrated here from Trier, Germany in the 1830s. They purchased this house near Indian Hill along with several acres of farmland in 1841. We'll get a closer look at the log house at its new location later. Today, Indian Hill is home to the Indian Hill Club. Originally founded in 1912 as the Winnetka Country Club, the members thought that name didn't sound right. For one thing, they weren't technically in Winnetka, though they were right next door. For another, when they started construction on the new golf course in 1914, locals discovered arrowheads from the Miami Indians. So they decided to rename the course Indian Hill after the various native people who lived there. The name Indian Hill remains as a reminder of the native people who were Winnetka's first founders. Our next stop is in the heart of Winnetka, Village Hall. Village Hall was built in 1925 and was designed by one of Winnetka's most prolific architects, Edwin Clark. He designed many of the village's most important buildings, like the Women's Club and dozens of houses that still stand today. Originally, it was called the Winnetka Administration Building, because, you know, that's what they do there. It's where the village administration decides much of the town business, like roads and utilities improvements. But that wasn't the first village government building in Winnetka. Before Village Hall, city managers met at Academy Hall. Built in 1870 as a school, it serves as the village's governance building from 1900 to 1925, when it was transformed into a fire department. But even that wasn't the first village government building. That one was here, across the street from Village Hall, at the Winnetka train station. The old train station was used as a meeting place for local government before the village was founded. Because of the train, commuters and developers started coming to Winnetka, putting it on the map, and helping the small town grow into a village. But there was one major problem with the old Winnetka train station. Can you guess what that is? No, it wasn't the fact that you had to shovel the train out, though that would be annoying. The problem was that the old train station was at the same level as the street, which was very dangerous for pedestrians, horses, and eventually cars. The village engineer Frank Wines took on the challenge of solving the problem and drew up this diagram. He determined that the village needed to lower the train tracks and build bridges for cars to pass overhead. But it took 30 years to get others on board. In 1938, Frank Wines' train finally came in, and the village started construction on the track depression. His plan to lower the tracks took five years and was completed in 1943. 
Remember the Native American relief from the Indian Hill train station? That was created at the same time. And today, the train station is safer and more beautiful thanks to those city planners of the past. On your right is one of Winneka's most celebrated spaces, the Village Green. It's where Winneka has come to meet and honor its past and present. This plot of land was donated to Winneka by Charles Peck in 1869 with the stipulation that it remain a public park forever. This cenotaph monument was erected in 1928 to honor the veterans of the First World War. A cenotaph is a memorial to someone who is buried somewhere else. The cenotaph on the Village Green was paid for by subscriptions from hundreds of residents. The design was part of a competition won by Samuel Otis. After World War II, the village added to the memorial to honor more Winnetka veterans. Here's a picture of World War II veterans on Memorial Day in 1954. The Village Green has always been used for patriotic ceremonies. This photo shows an outdoor play about the signing of the Declaration of Independence on July 4th, 1913. But the most notable celebration of democracy at the Village Green came in 1965, when Martin Luther King Jr. spoke to a crowd of thousands of North Shore residents. Dr. King was invited to Winneka by the North Shore Summer Project, a group of young mothers angered at housing discrimination in their community. King's speech in Winnetka came at the end of a long day of rallies around the Chicago area. But King was used to long days of speaking, and when he got on stage, he spoke directly to the young mothers of the North Shore Summer Project, telling them what they could do to make the American dream a reality. Then he laid out a plan for how to build a better, more democratic, and diverse society, urging them the time is always right to do right. And he called on them to march with him the next day from Buckingham Fountain in Chicago to City Hall to protest segregation in the city. The Village Green will forever remember Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech because of a group of eighth grade students and their teacher at Washburn School who asked the village to memorialize Dr. King's visit in 2007. Now we can remember the patriotism of protest when we celebrate Memorial Day and the 4th of July at the Village Green. Here we are looking at a neat looking building at 700 Elm Street, the Hadley Institute for the Blind and Visually Impaired. This is the fourth building on this spot, each of which contributed to Winneka's growth as a village. The first building here was Hap's Blacksmith's Shop. There was no Elm, no 700, no Winneka at the time, but when John Hap immigrated to the area in the 1840s, he recognized the need for a blacksmith shop. This picture is actually from a later blacksmith shop, but John Hap Jr. is there in the back looking on in the white shirt. Look at those horseshoes. Imagine what it would smell like with all those horses walking around Winneka. Luckily, this trolley is gas-powered. This beautiful church was built at 700 Elm in 1885. It was Winneka Congregational Church's second location. This wood building burned down in 1907, and the church is now located at 725 Pine Street. In 1922, these guys built the third building at 700 Elm. They are the Freemasons, and in this photo, they're signing their constitution for their new Masonic Lodge. Sadly, they lost ownership of the building during the Great Depression. The land was then purchased in 1951 by the Hadley School for the Blind. The Hadley School had been in operation since 1920. Their founder, William Hadley, who had lost his sight later in life, started a How to Read Braille by Mail program, sending people lessons through the Postal Service. In the 1950s, the Lions Club helped them build the school that is still at 700 Elm today. The men in this photo are standing outside Village Hall selling brooms to raise money for the Hadley's building. The building was completed in 1956. It included a recording studio where radio stars like Shirley Cole donated their time to make recordings. The Hadley School changed its name to the Hadley Institute in 2016 to better reflect its mission to serve people all over the country, not just in this building. Now buckle up, we're heading through downtown Winneka 
To the right, you can see Lincoln Avenue Business District. To the left, you can see Connie's Drugs. The pharmacy used to be on the north side of Elm Street in 1945, but when the railroad was at street level, remember when I said the railroad was at street level? The bottles used to shake as the trains went by. Connie's later moved to its current location here on the south side of Elm Street, and you can still get hand-mixed pharmaceuticals from them. Now we're approaching the Winnetka Community House. Reverend Davies thought up the idea for the community house back in 1909. He raised enough money to complete the building in 1911, which had 15 rooms and a gymnasium. In this photo, you can see a costume dance for kids, and they also had a gym for plays, sports, and, and speeches. In its first week, 51 groups used the community house. On the right, we're passing the bookstall. The bookstall is a wonderfully welcoming bookstore, originally named Chestnut Books, where many famous writers have started their national tours to sign books for Winnetka residents. One of the most famous of these authors was J.K. Rowling, creator of the Harry Potter universe, who visited during the height of Harry Potter fever. The line to meet Rowling stretched around the block. Now if you look down Chestnut Street, you can see the Winnetka Post Office. One of the early post offices was this small building pictured here from the 1940s. Rumor has it that movie star Rock Hudson had a postman route here when he was in high school, right around this time. The post office we have now was built in 1959 and was completed just in time. Postal codes, what we now call zip codes, were created in 1963. As we travel up Elm Street, we will pass a few schools, including Skokie and Washburn. Carlton Washburn was the superintendent of Winnetka Schools from 1919 to 1943, and he got to work very quickly. In his first year, in 1919, he oversaw the building of the Skokie School. And the Skokie School is very special. It has grand columns in the front. It really looks like a university. But Washburn wanted to do something different with Winnetka schools. So he traveled around the world to see how schools worked in Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. He wanted to bring the progressive education strategies he discovered in the rest of the world to Winnetka. His ideas became known as the Winnetka Experiment. And the Winnetka Experiment started with the design of the Crow Island School. In 1940, Washburn planned the school to be the first designed for progressive education in Winnetka. He wanted a school designed for students. Notice how small the shelves and desks are compared to the architect, Larry Perkins, who's standing in this photo. Washburn wanted everything to fit the students. And Washburn asked teachers to work directly with the architect to design the desks, the cupboards, and even the stage in the assembly hall. It was a school designed for kids. It was also designed to be fun, with colorful classrooms, art, and music. Washburn wanted to mix play and education together, like they did here in the Pioneer Room. Crow Island School was named after the Crow Island Woods, where our next stop, the Schmidt Burnham Log House, resides. Now this is my favorite spot, the Schmidt Burnham Log House. Remember at the beginning of the tour when we saw this house? Well, it's moved around a bit since the 1830s when it was built. Anita Willits Burnham, a Chicago artist, fell in love with the log house and purchased it in 1917 for just $25. She then had the entire thing moved from Indian Hill to Tower Road on the other side of Winnetka. Her family lived there for the next 80 years. Then, in 2003, the Winnetka Historical Society, headed by Joan Ebenich, moved the log house again. This time, they lifted the old house from Tower Road and placed it here on Willow Road in Crow Island Woods, right in the middle of Winnetka. Now let's go in and see the log house. Let's check it out. Hey, it's Megan McChesney of the Winnetka Historical Society. Hi, uh, would you mind showing us around? Sure. Come on in. 
Eleven people lived in this room and the two rooms upstairs when the house was at Indian Hill. When the Burnham family moved in, they decided to expand it to fit a modern family when they moved it to Tower Road. This section of the house reflects the fun and adventurous nature of the Burnham family. Here are some of Anita Burnham's art supplies, her palette, and one of her paintings of downtown Chicago. Over here is Anita's one-of-a-kind invention, a rolling suitcase. This may be the first rolling suitcase ever created. Next time you're at an airport pulling your luggage behind you, remember that Anita was the first to discover that convenience. She used her suitcase as the family traveled around the world, to Africa, Europe, and Asia in the 1920s and 30s, which she chronicled in her book, Around the World on a Penny. You can read more about it and see Anita's art and invention here at the Schmidt Burnham Log House on Willow Road. I hope to see you here soon. Now we head off to the Skokie Lagoons. These pretty little ponds look like they've always been a part of the village, but they are entirely man-made. Before the Skokie Lagoons, this area was a swamp. Remember how I said the native people who settled in Winnetka were Potawatomi? We still use a shortened version of the Potawatomi word for swamp, Wabskoki, or Skokie, to describe this area. What? Frank Wines, the town engineer who dreamed up the track depression, remembered fishing in the old swamp as a kid. He said, as small boys, we would build two small dams across the Skokie stream. We would wade in the stream and beat the water with sticks, scaring the fish between our two dams. After we had some 20 to 30 good-sized bass, pickerels, catfish, or perch enclosed, we would close the dam and then shovel out the fish, and everyone in town had a fine mess of fish. Well, not everyone liked the swamp as much as Mr. Wines, because their houses flooded. In 1933, Winnetka finally got a chance to fix the old swamp. A Winnetka native, Harold Ickes, was the Secretary of the Interior for the United States under President Franklin Roosevelt. He was able to plan a Civilian Conservation Corps project to improve the area. They made plans to turn the swamp into a series of lagoons to control the water flow and look a heck of a lot better, too. The plan included lakes, floodplains, connecting channels, flood control dams, and perimeter ditches. It changed life in Winnetka and all along the North Shore. The project took until 1942 to complete, almost 10 years. It also provided more than flood relief. The building of the Skokie Lagoons gave over a thousand people jobs during the Great Depression. They built a barracks in Glenview called Skokie Camp, where the men stayed while they worked. But it wasn't all work at the camp. They had their own band and baseball team for entertainment. These men moved more than four million cubic feet of earth. That meant they needed a lot of help. They needed newly invented backhoes and tractors to lift and move the dirt and rocks. And that meant they needed engineers and mechanics to fix the equipment and keep the project moving. Today, the Skokie Lagoons are the beautiful result of the Civilian Corps' work. Some were nice for a picnic or just a nice view as we drive around on our trolley tour. But, of course, it serves a greater purpose. It keeps water out of the houses. Now we head down the northern edge of Winnetka on Tower Road towards the lake. The Schmidt Burnham Log House used to be on Tower Road. And when it was here, Anita Willits Burnham named this street Tower Road because you could see the old water tower if you looked straight down the street to the lakefront. This was the view you would have as you headed down Tower Road towards the beach. While we travel along Tower Road, look to your left and you will see some whimsical houses. This is affectionately known as the Swedish Village. 
They were designed by Swedish architect Andrew W. Paulson, who lived in Winnetka from 1905 to 1939. Some of them have rounded roofs like a hobbit home. Others are pointed like a Viking home. At the end of Tower Road, we have the newest tower, which is part of the municipal plant. This plant is special because it is owned and operated by the village of Winnetka. We don't have to rely on anyone else to power our TVs, cell phones, and computers. Next to the power plant is Tower Road Beach, which anyone with a season pass can use. Winnetkans have a long history of using the beaches for fun day trips. They are a place to relax and enjoy the sun, to walk and explore, and to boat on Lake Michigan. If you were standing on the beach in 1860, you could witness the wreckage washing ashore from the steamship Lady Elgin. This ship was accidentally rammed by the schooner Augusta. It was heading back to Milwaukee from Chicago when a storm caused the two ships to crash together. 297 of the 400 people on board died. The survivors clung to the wreckage they could find and desperately tried to swim ashore. Heroic Winnetka citizen Jacob Conrad jumped into the water from the Winnetka Bluffs with a rope tied around his waist. He saved 28 people. Many of the survivors were brought to the Gage House, just north of here. His son Pete saved a piece of wreckage of the Lady Elgin, and we have it in our collection at the Winnetka Historical Society. Our final stops are just down the street on Sheridan Road. As we head down Sheridan Road, take a look at this photo from 1897, taken from the top of the water tower. If you look on the upper right corner, you can see the old church built in 1869 by John Garland. This was Winnetka's first church. Here's a close-up view of the church Garland built. It was later moved to Elm Street in 1904, where it was used by the Winnetka Bible Church until it was demolished in 1964. We have some of the surviving timber at the Winnetka Historical Society because, as you have noticed, we have a lot of old stuff. This limestone Gothic building is the site of the oldest church in Winnetka, now called Church on the Hill, Christ Church. This Christ Church building was built in 1905 by the Hoyt family. The Hoyts hired Winnetka architect William Otis to build the church like the small county parishes in England. Here's a photo of the 1905 Christ Church building. It was beautiful and quaint in a medieval English kind of way, but very quickly the congregation needed even more room, so they expanded to the building we see today. This building was built in 1929, when, in spite of the economic hardships caused by the stock market crash, they raised $300,000. Looking out again from the old water tower in this photo, you can see 830 Sheridan Road. This home was built by one of Winnetka's most distinguished citizens, Henry Demarest Lloyd. Lloyd named it the Wayside after the tavern that the previous owner ran. Lloyd was a journalist and editor for the Chicago Tribune, and he had a poetic sensibility. He saw this house, the Wayside, as a stopping point along Sheridan Road, just as the farmhouses, taverns, and blacksmith shops had been stops on the old Green Bay Trail back in the 1830s. Here you can see the Lloyd House, which is now a national landmark. In this house, Lloyd played host to important Americans, writers, politicians, and thinkers such as Governor John Altgeld and activist Booker T. Washington. Here's Lloyd in his third floor study. This is where he wrote three of his books, including his most well-known, Wealth Against Commonwealth, in 1894. He cared about his community and his country, running for political office and working with the town of Winnetka. He even came up with the original plan to lower the railroad tracks. The wayside represents the values of Winnetka a place that is more than just a stopping point between Chicago and Milwaukee. It's a community who cares about its contribution to history. Through the art of Anita Willits Burnham, the patriotism at the Village Green, the service of the Hadley Institute, the innovation at the Crow Island School, and the work at the Skokie Lagoons, Winnetka has carved out an impactful community on the North Shore.
The Winnetka History Express is presented by the Winnetka Historical Society. Our mission is to honor and preserve the village's heritage, gather and share the artifacts and stories of its past, and foster meaningful connections among Winnetkans and the broader community. We manage two historic properties, our museum and headquarters at 411 Linden Street and the Schmidt Burnham Log House at Crow Island Woods, where we hope to see you soon. We hope you enjoyed your journey throughout Winnetka's storied past. Thanks for joining us on the Winnetka History Express.